Uh, yeah, as, as you heard tonight, the, the title of this talk is um, The Cloud of Unknowing. And um, uh, yeah, I'm going to talk about uh, the cloud and clouds in general for a little while, um, which is something that I think about quite a lot. Um, so let's go. Um, clouds have always been part of our thinking. That's a very broad statement, obviously, but I, I like this history of clouds and particularly the history of clouds for divination. Uh, in ancient Greece and other cultures, as in the present, people look to the skies in an attempt to, to divine the future. This was called nephrology uh, or ne nephrostronomy, nephrostronomy, rather. Um, and the thing about this kind of cloud divination and, and all other of these forms of divination is that it attempts to access a wider world for signs, um, but ultimately they really only reflect on our thinking. Um, they reflect what we see in them. And it's, and I think this is still true about the other kind of clouds I'm gonna talk about now. Um, as you heard, um, in medieval times, the cloud came to stand for what we can't know, what is essentially unknowable, uh, for what we can't see. Um, this, this book, the, this text, The Cloud of Unknowing, was written in the 14th century by an unknown monk um, and it describes how this inability to see, this cloudiness, was appropriate uh, to reminding us of, of the unknowability of God and our own humanity in reflection. Um, uh, the intention was that it should humble us, that we should recognize our own limitations, um, and that we should always understand that there are greater forces than us at work. And we should you know, be comfortable in that position. We should be all right with this, with this, with this lack of knowing of the world, because only God could have perfect knowledge of the world. And we, humble humans, um, should 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 um, keep to our keep to our role. Um, and I'll come back to why I think that's important at the end. Um, at the end of the nineteenth century, um, the famous art critic John Ruskin um, used the figure of clouds in his teaching um, to explain or well, to teach aesthetic understanding, to teach things like perspective, but also teach about kind of human arts relationship to nature. But he also believed really he could see the future in them too. Uh, he, he delivered a series of lectures very late in his life called the storm cloud of the 19th century, uh, in which he described how he could see a new cloud in the sky. Um, he described it as a, a thunder cloud, a storm cloud, a kind of brown or blackish vapor in the air. And he thought that it emanated from kind of battlefields and sites of conflict. He thought this cloud had a kind of moral quality to it. Um, although later critics have been quick to point out that at the time he was writing, it was really at the peak of the industrial revolution in England. Um, there were chimneys and factories going up all around the Midlands and the North of England, all around Ruskin's home. And so the cloud he describes is also the cloud of, of, of the growing industrial revolution, of the acceleration of industry. And, and have figured kind of in, uh, Ruskin as a kind of early environmentalist for pointing this out. And it's kind of interesting that um, recently climate scientists have used art and paintings as a resource themselves. You've, there's research papers you can read in which people analyze uh, landscape paintings from the kind of 17th century onwards trying to see in them the changes that humans have wrought to the atmosphere itself by our own activities. Like everything else, this is reflected in art over time and we can kind of read it back into the paintings with the knowledge of today. Today we have this very much more scientific attitude um, to the atmosphere and to the weather. Um, we've spent uh, centuries classifying it codifying it, trying to kind of come to terms with it in various ways. And, and in the 20th century, that effort has become more and more um, systematized, more and more programmable um, uh, with the rise of, of computers themselves that haven't just you know, made the weather knowable in these kind of computable ways. They've kind of changed the way that we think about it. We've transformed it from being a kind of entirely natural process, something beyond the knowledge and control of humankind into something that we can replicate mathematically. Um, 
And, and that's that's a process that hasn't just happened to the weather. It's a process that's happened to to pretty much all of everyday life with the growth of with computers and and the the, the growth of their kind of mathematical computational power. Uh, the lesson we seem to have drawn from that is that the whole world is computable and programmable and processable in this way. The, this is a picture of one of the very first computers. Uh, this is the ENIAC, which was constructed in the 1940s, um, basically for two purposes, uh, to design and build atomic weapons and to predict the weather. This, those were the two things that basically drove the development of, of computers from the 1940s onwards and still continue to drive them in many ways today. Um, it, was, uh, it was John von Neumann, who is uh, an early computer, um, essentially the progenitor of modern computers, one of them. Uh, he had these twin interests, essentially. He worked on the Manhattan Project uh, and he was also um, uh, involved in various meteorological circles. And he saw that this incredibly powerful computation could be used to both perform the mathematical calculations needed for the atomic bomb uh, and to perform mathematical simulations of the weather that would allow us to predict it better. The thing about prediction in this case, the thing about uh, um, uh, this belief in computing the world better, um, uh, it leads always in, in one particular direction, which is it leads to a belief in the possibility of control. Um, this is um, uh, Vincent Schaefer, who was a scientist at General Electric in, in, in New York, the big US uh, company. And in the 1950s, he developed the science of cloud seeding. Um, this was the, um, uh, the science behind being able to effectively generate kinds of weather. Schaefer found that you could distribute silver crystals uh, into the atmosphere. Uh, and when it became humid enough, they would actually cause clouds to form. And there was this belief that you could create the weather in this way. Tied to computational prediction is this belief that um, kind of man's growing programmatic uh, understanding of the world could be shaped into this form of kind of control and direction. That in the future, we would be able to not merely to predict the weather to forecast it. We'd actually be able to control it, decide where the rain falls and where it hailed, which obviously has kind of huge um, implications for, for agriculture and other things, but also has huge implications for war, um, the huge military interest in this ability um, to control the weather. Um, uh, this, this, is, this proved controversial in many ways. Uh, there's uh, much more of it to go into today, but the, the main exponents of, of cloud seeding today is the, is the Chinese government. Uh, this is a Chinese uh, cloud seeding truck. They actually use uh, large truck mounted batteries of rockets, which fire um, uh, silver halide and other compounds into the clouds in order to try and uh, produce the rain. Uh, they do this for agricultural purposes to try and seed crops. Uh, they also do it for political purposes. It was extensively used, for example, uh, in the run-up to the Olympics uh, in, in Beijing, um, whenever it was, eight years ago, is that right? Um, in order to produce fine sunny weather and to kind of dismiss the smog uh, that usually shrouds Beijing. And they continue to do it uh, on, on kind of large state events like this. So the, the, um, the power of cloud seeds, which was repudiated really by the US, Britain and, and, and other places, uh, when it proved to have unpredictable effects uh, is well under under way in, in China and other places. Um, those weren't the kind of clouds that I was really going to talk about though, though you, I hope through this you'll see, you see why I mentioned them at the beginning and why I think they're important. There's a very different kind of cloud uh, I'm going to talk about um, for, the, for most of the rest of this talk, uh, which is the computational cloud. Um, I'm sure you've all heard um, this term, the cloud used, mostly in advertising, it seems. Um, you know, if you, if you look through any magazine or particularly I've noticed visit any airport, not that many of us are doing that much at the moment, um, you may see these kind of huge adverts touting the, the benefits of the cloud, what extraordinary things the cloud can do, what the cloud can do for your business, what the cloud can do for your company and so on and so forth. This strange amorphous thing, the cloud, which, which I remain fascinated with, both as kind of actuality and as metaphor. And the cloud, the cloud that I'm talking about, the computational cloud, kind of begins in the 1950s. 
shortly after the development of those first computers, it begins just as a tiny doodle on the, in the diagrams of network engineers, a bit like the little clouds you see at the top of this more contemporary diagram. Um, basically, whenever, whenever the engineers needed to describe something that was part of their network or rather their network connected to, but was kind of remote from it um, and, and also was, was kind of self-contained and away from what they were dealing with it, they draw this little squiggle that looked like a kind of thought bubble or eventually a, a cloud. Um, and that cloud basically denotes everything we don't have to care about. That's what it meant in these engineers' diagrams and it's the role it still kind of performs today. The cloud is over there. It, it contains, but also hides everything that we don't really have to think about. Um, it's, it's the place where we can put complex, uh, powerful machines and all kinds of information um, and, and let it be over there and let other people worry about it. And out of that kind of creation of the cloud, um, we get a huge amount of kind of contemporary um, politics, but also our worldview. Um, this, this belief that everything can be computed is, is paired or twinned with this, um, this kind of distancing and putting away uh, behind a kind of fog bank of, of, of where power and knowledge is actually operating and being traded and being performed and being processed. And that has kind of deep consequences for us as a society. Um, the ENIAC is, 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 a, is a nice way of thinking about this really. Because um, as you can see back in the 1940s, as you probably know, computers looked like this, right? They were, they were room sized, if not rooms themselves. The ENIAC actually took up a kind of a couple of rooms with every wall and lots of available space covered with these kind of banks of switches and blinking lights and wires. And, and there was something very interesting and powerful about that. Um, uh, the first of it is that is it made computation kind of kind of legible, right? Um, if you you know have one of these in your pocket, which many of you do, one of these little black kind of this is my phone I'm holding up if I'm tiny, one of these kind of black little um, shiny shiny boxes, um, you know almost nothing uh, about what goes on inside it. Most of us don't. I mean they're, they're incredibly complex tiny machines. But within these old mainframes, you could you could step inside this thing, and if you knew what computation was being formed uh, performed, you could literally watch this kind of process happening as a series of connections and lights moved across the walls around you. And this is very powerful. It speaks to a kind of legibility of processes, an ability to follow computation as it's happening that we've largely lost today, as these things have kind of miniaturized and shrunk. But to think of them as being miniaturized and shrunk is also to miss something really crucial. Um, there's a lovely phrase by a guy called Harry Reid in his memoirs. Uh, Reid was an engineer who worked on the ENIAC in its earliest days. And he said this really lovely thing about the ENIAC. He said that, um, he, he said that today, he's speaking kind of decades later, today we kind of think of computers as personal computers, as, as small things, you know, like, like the phone I was speaking of. But... Um, the ENIAC was a personal computer in the sense that you inhabited it, that you lived inside it like architecture and it formed itself around you. So even for Reed, there was this feeling that this computational space had kind of shrunk down. But actually what happened is it got bigger. What happened is that the, the ENIAC and computers around it, this kind of total computing environment spread out in order to cover the entire face of the earth. Um, and even you know, into outer space in the form of satellites and became kind of threaded through the entire structure of the world. That's what we're really talking about, absolutely, and, and quite specifically when we talk about the computational cloud. We're talking about a, an architecture of computation that envelops the whole planet, just as this kind of idea of computation, of the world as something programmable uh, and to be programmed and, and comprehensible through programming has kind of enfolded our entire culture and civilization. But to speak of the cloud again as something kind of vast and numinous, as something cloudy, is, is to miss out once again on what it is because the cloud is also physical. The cloud comes down to earth in specific places. Um, it has weight and it has architecture. And this particularly striking example, which 
to be sure. I, I, I have seen this building in real life and I cannot tell whether this image uh, I'm starting to realize looking at it, I think is also a computer rendering of a real building, which is just even better. Um, but I first saw this building in real life, again, maybe a decade ago, when walking through uh, East London. And when I saw it, I had no idea what it was. Um, uh, but it turned out to be the internet. Um, this is a, a data center. Um, this is a place where the cloud comes down to earth. It's a, it's a very large, uh, solid building, mostly filled with computers. Um, because this is what the cloud actually is. It's huge buildings on the edges of cities filled with huge numbers of computers humming away. This is where we've put all of that computation that we didn't think we needed to care about. Uh, we put it into kind of windowless vast buildings like this uh, where it does whatever it is that it does. Most data centers aren't as computer looking as this. So this is, remains one of my favorite examples. Um, most of them look more like this, uh, which is also a better example of what I'm talking about because uh, a number of years ago, I, I, I did a walk um, from roughly around Heathrow Airport uh, or Slough, a town um, uh, about 25 miles uh, west of London, all the way through the center of London and, and kind of 25 miles or so out to the east uh, following the lines of communication between data centers, uh, following kind of microwave lines and cables under the ground that connect these kind of sites of power, because that's what it, well, that's what they are, and this is what this is. This is the, um, though you would never know it from looking at it the outside, this is the New York Stock Exchange's European data center uh, in Basildon, just outside London. Within this, you know, um, uh, incredibly kind of blunt and un, uh, descriptive exterior um, are the computers which run one of the largest stock exchanges in the world. Billions and billions of dollars pass through this building every day in the form of ones and zeros. And most of us, uh, like with the operation of the stock market itself, have absolutely no idea what's going on in there. This, this power that the data centers have is, um, and the cloud itself embodies, um, is interesting in the way that it continues and continues to perform and continues to carry and continues to kind of engrave onto the surface of the earth um, uh, lines of pre-existing power, uh, particularly imperial ones. Uh, this is a map of submarine cables as they wend their way around the earth. Uh, these are the cables that run underneath the ocean that carry internet traffic from continent to continent and country to country. Um, there's surprisingly few of them, though there are more and more all the time. And it's, a, it's an incredible infrastructure in its own right. Uh, strange things happen here. Sharks can eat through cables. Uh, boats can drag their uh, anchors across them, cutting off the connection to whole countries. And when that happens, you realize suddenly the kind of fragility of these infrastructures um, as they actually exist. Um, but, it, but as I say, that's not... Um, uh, that's, that's, their fragility is not their only point. They also have this incredible hardiness. One of the things you notice when looking at these maps of, of the way the contemporary internet is structured is that it follows the old lines of empire and colonialism. Um, the countries of, of West Africa uh, that used to be uh, colonies of Britain, you'll find that they have direct fiber cables that link them back to Britain before they link them to anywhere else, even to their neighbors. Uh, countries in, in South America, for example, also have cables that link them uh, directly back to Spain and their, and their internet companies, uh, their telecommunications companies, uh, the cables themselves are still constructed by Spanish owned businesses. So, so those imperial, those imperiums, those empires that we spent the 20th century apparently demolishing are very much alive and well at the level of infrastructure, at the level of the cloud and the cloud continues to to, to maintain and, and um, administer those empires uh, at this kind of level of engineering. And of course, they also provide uh, a form of contemporary imperialism in the form of corporate ownership of the cloud. Um, this, is, this is possibly the most important, you know, or most significant point about, about the nature of the cloud itself is that it's private. It's, uh, I would say it's been privatized, except it's always been private. Uh, it's a commercial and corporate enterprise. These five companies, 
Google, Amazon, Microsoft, IBM, and Alibaba, uh, which is the one you might be less familiar with, but is the largest internet company in China. Um, these five companies own more than 95% of the cloud, um, which is one of those weird things. It's like, how do you own the cloud? But as I hope you've been understanding from my description of the cloud as something concrete and solid as large buildings filled with computers, um, that's, um, that's uh, they, they, they own those buildings and they own those computers. That's how they can own the cloud. And of course, as a result, they own us. They own our memories. They own uh, everything about us, all of our data, all of our information, the photos that you share on your, on your phone, your tax returns, uh, your government runs on these services. Uh, these services contain the most of the most of the operations today of 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 most of the world's governments. Uh, the Amazon, for example, also, you know, runs the Department of Defense's uh, web services uh, for the U.S. government. The U.S. Army runs on Amazon. So these are incredibly powerful players, and we've given up, you know, control really of of so much of that that information. And the power over it has been handed over to these companies with really very little thought about what's entailed. Um, we, we've, you know, so desperate to use the power for ourselves that they provide that we've essentially given them more power to build up and strengthen their their hold over the cloud. Um, so the the, corpor the 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 cloud is, as I say, it's physical and has real space and exists within kind of legal jurisdictions, it exists under the laws of countries to some extent, but more than that belongs to these kind of transnational companies and can shift itself from place to place, even while re-inscripting the kind of lines of old, old empires that I was describing. And the cloud is, as a result of that, a weapon and weaponizable. Uh, I mentioned before that, that computers and, and computational thinking which is what I call this kind of belief in the world that can be programmed and programmable and thus predicted and controlled, emerges very specifically from, from kind of mid-century, um, the mid-20th century uh, and, and the development of the atomic bomb. Um, the first computers were built to uh, simulate and, and, and design the very first atomic bomb. So when we speak of the cloud, and the computational cloud, it, we have to go back to the, the mushroom cloud as the kind of originator of this explosion of computation. But one of the cloud's most effective operations, as I said, is kind of hiding itself away. And it's even managed to do that to the mushroom cloud. This is where the mushroom cloud is now. These are the, um, the supercomputers of the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory uh, in the USA. Uh, these are what's called a virtual battlefield, because since the banning of um, uh, nuclear, of, of real world nuclear tests some sort of 20 years ago, it's now internationally agreed by almost all countries that they won't physically test nuclear bombs. The way they test them is in the cloud, in computers. The, these, this is the uh, at last ranking, I believe, the third most powerful computer in the world, and it's used almost entirely for simulating atomic explosions. Which is to say that those who hold the most processing power, who have command over the biggest part of the cloud, have the most power in contemporary society, both to do things like simulate and, and therefore design and build nuclear weapons, but also control over information and control of our, uh, our almost our entire sensorium as we experience it through the network, uh, the ability to to, uh, to view, store, process uh, our information and therefore to present it back to us and guide us through the network in ways that are kind of amenable uh, to them. Something very odd about the, um, uh, the what's the word? Uh, the physicality of the cloud is this. Uh, it begins to take on certain almost natural qualities. Uh, it becomes part of the environment and part of the landscape, and not just in the way that the cables themselves kind of thread through the ground and under the ocean, um, but the operation itself starts to, to meld uh, with the environment. Uh, in this case, um, the example is the fact that data centers, uh, in some case, are migrating north. 
Um, this is uh, Google's data center in, Hami in Hamina, or Hamina, I'm sorry, uh, in Finland, which is within about 100 miles of the Arctic Circle. Um, Facebook has also built um, a data center in northern Sweden for the same reason and, 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 and in various other places around the world um, because computers run hot. And one of the biggest expenses of running a lot of computers, of running the cloud, is you have to spend a lot of money cooling them down. So the further north you can put them, uh, the less money it costs to run them. So there's a huge financial incentive for, for the cloud to kind of shift itself polewards, to, to move northwards, to take advantage of, of colder climes, but also as, of um, kind of cheap hydroelectricity and, and, other, uh, and other benefits. And, and so you see, if you look at the geography of the cloud, you see the way it clusters around these kind of environmental cues. Um, the flip side to um, these, this example of a data center migrating north uh, for cheap hydropower, supposedly clean and you know, um, environmentally friendly, if you don't mind all your rivers being dammed, um, is the fact that the vast majority of, of contemporary internet processing power is fueled by coal. This is, the, this is the reality of, of the internet as it exists today, is that it's actually an incredibly power hungry, consuming and ultimately polluting industry. Um, it's estimated that the CO2 output of the cloud, this, as I say, supposedly kind of fluffy, numinous, invisible thing is about equivalent to the airline industry. Uh, and it is probably far outstripping it in the last year as we've all stopped flying and using our computers more. Um, the cloud produces vast amounts of CO2 and other greenhouse gases, um, as well as all the other kind of extractive uh, industries that relies on kind of mining for rare earth metals and other materials uh, that are hugely detrimental to the environment. So the cloud doesn't just have a, um, you know, a shadow, it has a, it has a footprint, an environmental footprint on the earth that is, that is hugely costly. Um, as I said, the, the, um, the cloud is a, is a huge contributor to, um, to, to greenhouse gases and other kinds of pollutants. Um, and so when thinking about the kind of accelerational drive of computer technology over the last 20th, 20th century, this is really the graph that kind of tells us the most about it. Um, this is the, uh, the Keeling curve or the, um, the, the measurements of, of CO2 in the atmosphere um, over the last 50 years, almost exactly since the uh, birth of, of computation, which of course is not entirely all due to, um, uh, to computers alone, but reflects exactly the same, um, the same drive, the same kind of momentum that our computational uh, revolution successor to the industrial revolution has kind of inflicted upon the environment. Um, and it's particularly, it's particularly striking to me that, that as our technologies advance, they become even more processor intensive and thus more polluting. Um, recent research has showed that actually the, the most contemporary of, of technological advances, artificial intelligence is alongside Bitcoin, uh, pretty much the worst thing you can do for the environment. Uh, this, this graph illustrates the pounds of CO2 averaging a single round trip between New York and San Francisco, a single uh, human life averaged over one year, uh, American lives, uh, US driving, but at the bottom is training a single artificial intelligence model in the cloud. Uh, the number of computers that have to be put to work, uh, sucking up electricity, cooling, heating, all of that stuff, um, uh, far outstrips uh, the um, uh, almost all other single kind of uses. It's, it's extraordinary to me that our, our, our striving after some kind of other forms of intelligence is also directly detrimental uh, to our attempts to, to, to protect, say, or whatever ourselves, our, our own intelligence in the face of in the face of climatic change. Um, for um, that's not the only way in which these kind of vast reserves of computing power are affecting the environment, um, or even just those, those intelligences. A recent report from Greenpeace, which makes quite extraordinary reading, details the way in which uh, artificial intelligence, these, this kind of incredibly new, exciting technology, which, which requires the cloud to function, 
um, because it's so processor intensive, because it requires so many computers, um, uh, is, is also being deployed to um, uh, for profit by Google, Amazon, Microsoft, and the others to support the work of oil companies to extract every last possible remaining reserve uh, from from uh, from the from the you know ground of our planet, which is the most extraordinary you know thing when you think about it. The fact that by extracting all of this oil and gas and burning it, we doom ourselves. And yet that is what we are putting our, our smartest, supposedly intelligent technology to work to do. Uh, that is where our, our belief in this kind of computational intelligence and, and the power of the cloud is taking us at present. Which is also startlingly ironic to me when you understand what the effects of, of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere really are. We know that it's slowly increasing the temperature. Um, it's also making us dumber. Um, uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere passed, I think, has passed through 420 now. Um, but uh, in enclosed spaces, um, in classrooms, uh, dormitories, uh, your bedroom, uh, uh, quite possibly the room where you're sitting in now, I advise you to open the window. Um, uh, carbon dioxide levels regularly pass a thousand parts per million. And above a thousand parts per million, human cognitive ability, our ability to think itself, drops below 20%. Um, drops by 20%, rather than say. We, we, are, we are made dumber by higher carbon dioxide levels. And so we have this extraordinary position where we are filling the atmosphere with clouds of carbon dioxide both produced by and abetted by uh, our computational technologies. They are getting smarter, more extractive, uh, and, um, and more polluting as our own intelligence dips as a result. And they're doing that at the information level as well as at the kind of gaseous level. This is the role that the cloud kind of performs in society at the moment. Um, this is, uh, in this image you can see, uh, Walter Cronkite, the US news anchor, uh, in a broadcast from 1980, speaking very clearly, very directly, very honestly uh, about climate change. Uh, he presenting a report in which it's very clear what is going on. There are no dissenting voices. Uh, the scientists are unanimous on the effects of this. Um, and this is, this is how this information was presented in 1980. Here you see in the wider picture how this image, how this information is presented in 2020. You can watch Walter Cronkite, and next Google will offer you uh, a selection of uh, conspiracy theorists and climate denialists and an outright misinformation to counter precisely what you've just heard. Uh, and it will do this because that's what's good for its advertising revenue. It's discovered. Uh, partly directly and partly through the operation of its algorithms. That's showing people stuff that shocks them more um, uh, is better for keeping them watching. And so it has trained itself, uh, Google's algorithms, uh, but others, news, Facebook's newsfeed and these other kind of cloud-based systems have trained themselves to essentially radicalize people, to draw our attention away uh, from the... Um, uh, the central issues of our time uh, into ever more uh, divisive and uh, kind of fundamentalist positions. Uh, once you understand that this is the role that the cloud is, is performing um, and the interest behind it, uh, everything starts to me to become maybe slightly more clear if you can, if you can think of that. Um, it, it starts to become more understandable why we, why we live in a society which everything seems to have become clouded in this way, in which agreement um, on, on even the most basic of, of questions seems to have become um, a, a, a impossible to obtain, in which only the most extreme uh, positions uh, seem, to be, seem to be gaining ground, um, in, which, uh, in which almost anything can become kind of a culture war, can become, can become radicalizable. Um, and we see this no more, no more clearly in, in even our, our reaction to, to a virus, something where it should be clearly possible to disseminate kind of scientific advice. And yet the operation of the cloud has continues to kind of split society into incredibly strange and, and odd, odd um, combinations. Uh, and I think it should be 
no surprise then that um, at the same time the the cloud we're seeing most often deployed against people who uh, whose rallying cry is I can't breathe um, the clouds of kind of tear gas uh, but also these these clouds of, of of misinformation and uncertainty we find ourselves at the still roughly the beginning of the 21st century a, a, a good hundred years after we started to build this kind of um, programmatic computational idea of the world that produced the cloud and ultimately became governed by it, we find ourselves entirely enmeshed in a global information system which is designed to bring us any information we want at any moment, at the touch of a button, all the information we could possibly imagine and ever dream, all of human knowledge. And yet the result is not us kind of coming together around one coherent narrative of the world, uh, of, of agreeing. Uh, the result, in fact, is kind of fundamental fundamentalism, division, increases in kind of all kinds of kind of um, fascism and totalitarian worldviews, um, which are produced largely by this kind of splintering of our worldview. Um, and that's something that's aided and abetted, it's really important to remember, by by, by those in power, whether those are corporations or politicians or various, various others, this benefits them. Um, uh, but it's also a result quite clearly of this cloudiness of the world in which we perceive, a world in which people know that vast and powerful forces are at work. And yet most of us have no idea how they work or where they're working or who's in charge of them because they occur kind of within this cloud. But, but to leave further discussion of that, um, perhaps the Q&A, um, I will bring this back very finally to, um, to the cloud of unknowing, which I think bears, um, bears thinking over once again, because I'm, as you may have noticed, quite the doomsayer on this stuff. Um, I'm fairly clear about what it is, I think, that um, the abuse of computational thinking uh, its capture by political and corporate forces uh, and our general lack of kind of education understanding around it is doing to our society. Um, and, and, and I, like many others, insist that seeing through the cloud to some extent, kind of, you know, shaking it apart, pointing to it and saying, you know, this is where it is, this is what it's doing, is kind of critical work uh, to kind of dispel some of these shadows that surround it. At the same time, the cloud being the most powerful and significant metaphor of our time can be kind of, for me, turned over once again. It can also be part of this reminder, as it was in the 14th century, of our unknowing. The fact that the, um, the cloud shows us through this kind of global web of information, everybody's reality at once, which is both its kind of grandest gesture and its greatest horror, this kind of extraordinarily existentially terrifying unfolding of multiple realities all brought right into our faces at once by, by the internet, um, that, that, that kind of has broken quite clearly our, our ability to think clearly about the world, can also once again be a reminder of, hum of our humility because there is no single central vision of the world. There never was. The, 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 the fracturing that has occurred is only in, in our minds. We see in the cloud, as I said about the, the diviners at the beginning, we only really see ourselves in this. And before, we ourselves was just us. Now ourselves really is everyone. And we have to recognize that the world is full of paradox and the world is full of difference. And the world is not something that can be easily understood about which we can tell simple narratives and stories. Simple narratives and stories are for PR departments and, and dictators. Uh, they, don't, they don't work for the rest of us. And the cloud for me is here to remind us of that. For all the damage it's doing in the present, it's significant to me, the greatest human achievement of the last hundred years is the building of something called the cloud. That is the knowledge we have put on the nature of uh, the name on which we put the nature of knowledge is it actually is. The world is cloudy. We have to live in it with a kind of humility and an understanding of that and be comfortable with our place in the world when we cannot control and predict everything. And that to me is the, 
the lesson that I that I personally take from the cloud and the one that I try to spread and talk about as much as possible. Uh, that's pretty much 45 minutes. So thank you very much. Uh, it's been a pleasure and I look forward to having a bit more conversation with you. Thank you.